Hi everybody, it's me Burrito and I'm here with the April 2024 development update for SWG Legends. We're going to go over a few things including space bounty hunting which just got added, Senate proposals that have been ratified and put into development, and finally some bug fixes. Starting with space bounty hunting, it is live and now for you all to try it out on the server. I'm just going to highlight a few things that I think everybody should know, but if you're a bounty hunter or a very active spacer in PvP, I recommend reading this entire section. But to start, just know that bounties can be placed as a result of any space PvP kill, except for duels and bounty hunter kills. This means that if you're having friendly duels somewhere in space, you can't put bounties on each other, and if you're defeated by a bounty hunter, you can't put a bounty on them. There are no level restrictions for this, unlike there is for other bounty hunting types in the game when it comes to ground. And for POB ships, the ship's owner can apply a bounty on the attacking ships, not the passengers. Similarly, 1,000 credits are automatically applied per PvP kill, even if the victim doesn't play, place a bounty on the target. So this means that during maybe a GCW space invasion, your PvP flag, you kill another player, even if they don't put a credit bounty on your head, you'll still get 1,000 credits added to your space bounty. This works the same as it does in ground PvP, so if you're familiar with that, it's the exact same system, but now in space. For POBs, it's the ship's owner that would receive the bounty and not the passengers. Bounty missions from the terminal will indicate which percentage of the total bounty amount applies to ground and space bounties. So that means that when you go, as a bounty hunter, when you go to the bounty terminal, you'll see a percentage for ground and space if a target on that terminal has bounties in both areas. If it's only space, it'll say space 100%. If it's only ground, it'll say ground 100%. If the bounty amount is only space, the target can only be hunted in space. If the bounty is only ground, the target can only be hunted on the ground. If the target has space and ground bounties, they can be hunted in both space and ground. This means that, you know, if you're a level 44 crafter, just destroying everybody in space PvP, the bounty hunter can't jump you when you land. Similarly, if you've just been going out into Restus, slaying everybody that you possibly can, if you jump up to space, you're going to be safe from any bounty hunters. However, if you do a little bit of both, they can hunt you anywhere, so keep that in mind. Unlike ground-based bounty hunting, there is no bounty hunter strike first in space. The target will immediately see the bounty hunter ship as red, and the bounty hunter will immediately see the target as red. This is really important for space, because unlike ground encounters, space encounters can be over in an instant. So allowing the bounty hunter to strike first would overwhelmingly give the bounty hunter an advantage in space. For POBs, the bounty hunter and the target must be in ships they own. This means that passengers of POBs cannot be hunted, and bounty hunters who are passengers on POB can't do bounty hunting. However, gunners aboard a bounty hunter's POB or the target's POB can participate in the fight. So again, if you're a bounty hunter and you take your own YT-2400 out, you can have gunners and they can help you out, but if you hop in a friend's YT-1300, you can't pick bounties doing that. It has to be your ship. Similarly, if you have a bounty on yourself and you know that, and you ride passenger and a gunner and say your friend's gunboat, they can't be hunted because of your space bounty. It has to be the ship's owner. Now that we've covered what I think is the most important parts about space bounty hunting, let's move right around to the Senate resolutions, which there are quite a few that have gotten enacted. Again, I might not go over these all in deep detail, but there are a lot of them that I do want to mention. First of all, starship hangars, which are player structures, those big brown boxes you'll see sticking out of the ground every once in a while, now have personal chassis dealers that the structure owner can use. Not the administrators, not guests, the structure owner. On Legends, you can get a starship hangar deed, by purchasing it from Dash Noons for 75,000 duty mission tokens or for completing the Ace of Aces collection. The Meat Lump theme park has two new tier 3 collections and rewards for those collections. I'm not sure what those are yet and I couldn't find anyone specifically noting what those rewards or collections are. So if you figure those out, let me know in the comments and feel free to share those in the community. It helps a lot. Tier 2 Creature Slayer collections now receive a title and a badge instead of just the badge. So more rewards for you for slaying all those creatures. Good job. Looking at Aurelia, Aurelia Trinkets vendors now sell two more slicing kits. These are the same existing slicing kits in the game. However, players now have an option to buy these kits for Kazash, Sinya, and Echo Base tokens instead of the traditional heroic tokens. So it's giving players a little bit more flexibility when getting those kits for slicing purposes. Similarly, Aurelian Crystals can now also be purchased with Kazash and Sinya tokens. So if you've already loaded up on those tokens, go ahead and get some of those crystal buffs for fun. For the user interface, we have a few changes. First of all, buff categories are now visible when hovering over a buff icon. 
This lets players better understand which buffs may occupy the same category, and here's some examples to show that. You can see that buff items like the Mustafari Injector occupy a broad category called Slot 3. Some have more specific categories like the Sprint Stim, which have Burst Run as a category. You can also have a category for your food buffs, and you have a category for your secondary food buffs, which in this example is showing as Category Snare. That will help players identify overlapping buffs a lot sooner and easier rather than having to check resources like wikis and ask other players about it. The Show All NPC Names checkbox and Options now also hides vehicle nameplates, so actually hides more names now, so that's really good. They've also added a command called forward slash clear toolbar, which will clear anything from the player's primary toolbar, or aka those horizontal toolbars at the bottom of your screen, unless you move them to the top. The vertical toolbars won't be affected, in other words, those side toolbars. When you use this toolbar command, though, it will clear everything from those horizontal toolbars, abilities, items, things from your data pad, etc. So this will be a really good way of changing your toolbars around if you really want to do that on the fly. Looking at the Storyteller category now, we see a quality of life improvement regarding blueprints, and the maximum amount of Storyteller tokens you can purchase has been increased from 100 to 500 at once. So, nice little treat for those who still use the Storyteller system frequently. The Chugon Dark Cube has gotten four new combinations. These combinations include weapon schematics for the Masasi Ink Rifle and Geonosian Rifle. This means that Weaponsmiths can now craft these weapons up to cap for players. So players who really like the CYM Ink Rifle or the AK Prime Rifle can now get that, but with the stats that they desire. That's really cool. Similarly, the other two combinations are components for crafting both of those weapons. None of the four combinations have been discovered as of writing this video, but we hope to discover them soon. And if you want to help in that process, go to the SWG Legends Discord and check the Crafters Corner. Myself and some other players have been discussing in there what combinations they've been working on so we can figure out which combinations these are. Regarding this note about Bespin Gas, not all Bespin Gas rewards were able to be listed on vendors. However, I believe they all now should be. So that should help with trading that gas around quickly. Moving on to the crafting session, we see one note here that says in-game mail will be sent to traders every 24 hours when a vendor maintenance pool is empty. I have found myself having this problem where, say, my vendor runs out of maintenance and I don't notice it and doesn't tell me and I only notice it until it's like stopped working entirely. So this is a really welcome change. Crafters also received some other changes that are not in these patch notes, so let's discuss those now. Namely, they received updates to hand sampling, which includes their expertise has been updated. The Extraction Techniques box now also provides an action cost decrease for hand sampling by up to 15%. This means traders with this full expertise will never stop sampling. You no longer need to spin in place or group up with an officer to keep your action flowing for sampling purposes. Second in the hand sampling updates, traders hand sampling radioactive resources will now receive a debuff. Previously, it would decrease the trader's health by a little bit, but it didn't really have an effect. But now there's this radiation sickness debuff. This debuff decreases the trader's maximum health points by 15%. It can stack up to five times for a total decrease of 75%. The debuff lasts for 15 minutes. Its duration refreshes each time the trader successfully samples a radioactive resource. So this means that if you're trying to sample a radioactive resource, but you get fail to locate sample, the duration will not reset to 15 minutes. The debuff is lost when the duration expires, the trader dies, or the trader is cured from a medic's serotonin boost ability. Lastly, in the center proposal sections, we can see that the temporary enemy flags will no longer be applied to players when attacked by factional NPCs. This means that if you're a rebel or imperial combatant and are attacked by NPCs of the opposite faction, you won't be locked out of your house for five minutes. Similarly, if you're special forces of either faction and you're only attacked by NPCs, you shouldn't be locked out of player structures either. This is really great because I recently have completed the Rebel and Imperial theme parks, and I noticed that since some of those objectives require me to be combatant and hit factional NPCs, when I try to go home to grab an item or transport to a different area, I'd be stuck trying to get into my house or another structure. So this is a really nice change. We appreciate it very much. On to the bug fixes section. Again, I'm not going to discuss all of these bug fixes, or some are pretty minor or very specific. Similarly, not all of these are technically bug fixes, but that's okay. I appreciate them nonetheless. First of all, Luke and Darth Vader's Special Forces quests will now complete correctly. These are the quests that you can get from these NPCs when they appear in non-player cities like Bastine, Theon, and Coronet. So, hurrah. There's a few Bespin-related fixes regarding space and beacons, but one Bespin fix I want to point out is that junk loot is now available from Bespin NPCs. So if you're questing around Bespin doing the quest lines or anything else, you can actually get junk loot from them now, which is, this is something that I pointed out 
during the 1 to 90 series, so I'm really happy to see this implemented. The Battle of Echo Base assigns cloning locations properly for the final stage, which is really great because if you get cloned to the wrong location at the wrong time, you can either have a long walk back to where the objective actually is, or you're going to get stuck behind some high-level NPCs. So, this is a nice fix. Space got a bunch of fixes. This includes the Ace, Pilot, Slayer collections now granting badges on completion. However, this doesn't apply to neutral collections, as those must be implemented at a later date. An issue was fixed with repair timers being bugged on POBs, and another issue was fixed with repairing POBs where if an undamaged component was trying to be repaired, it would still start a cooldown before you repair any other components. Good fixes to have. And finally, reward crates like the ones from convoys, beacons, etc. can now only be opened in a player's inventory. I've never even tried to open them in a house, but the fact that that or another container was possible is pretty funny. Race coordinator droids can count properly. Sick. Bestine election participants can now vote for Sean again, as after two election cycles, he'll forget any misgivings you had. So if anyone really wants to see Sean win and they betrayed him once, it's okay, he'll forgive you. Mustafar saw two fixes, which include salvage bandits in the Crystal Flats should now spawn in rocks less often. Cool. And the minor ambush quest shouldn't get stuck in a failed state anymore. That's also really great to see. City Update 2.0 has had a few fixes, but the one that I really want to point out, as many of you may have experienced, is that they fixed an issue with terrain rendering that would cause the terrain to flicker when loading into areas of the game. Some of you may have seen this on my stream. I've seen it a lot going from multiple areas. So this is a really great fix to see. If you continue to see this fix though, make sure to submit a ticket on the SWG Legends website. That way they can properly log and troubleshoot the problem. Moving on, I see some bug fixes for the Death Troopers theme park. Shouts to that, having done that recently. One of these includes Undead Griffiths. Jin is no longer associated with the Town Person faction. Well, we saw this in my 1 to 90 series where we slew him three times in a row and we basically pissed off every Ewok and Talents person in the galaxy by fighting an undead. So, very nice fix. They also fixed some NPC placement in the Blackwing facility to prevent them hiding in objects. I assume this mostly refers to the crates down in the mine section and maybe some other sections. That's a really nice fix as those guys were super annoying. Finally, escape prisoner NPCs will no longer groan like the undead. I honestly have never noticed that they did. So good ears on whoever caught and reported this. That's wild. Moving on, there are some fixes and updates to Heroic Dungeons. First of all, they fixed an issue that would prevent IG-88 from starting the instance properly, so I'm glad that bug got fixed in his circuitry. NPCs inside the Kazash and Sydney Heroics now count towards Dark Side collections. Cool. Reduces some of that grind. Players should no longer get stuck in a loop between incapacitation and standing in the Mustafar Beetle Cave. I haven't experienced this myself on Legends, but this sounds familiar, so I'm glad this got fixed. And finally, battle droids aboard the Corellian Corvette dungeons have been replaced with KX series droids for lore accuracy. Moving on to crafters, survival knives should now always have a socket if the manufacturing schematic specifies it has one. This is a nice fix because it was really frustrating to have one that says that it has a socket to only take a knife out of the box that says it doesn't. However, the bigger part of this change is that weapon socket chance is now the same as armor and clothing socket chance. 160 or more assembly guarantees the socket. I'm assuming this applies to all weapons and not just the survival knives. If so, that'd be a killer change because not getting a socket on a very important weapon craft, while rare, was very painful. So that's a really great change if it applies to all of them. Bith and Aquilish vendors should now wear clothes properly. So if you got any Bith or Aquilish, go ahead and feel free to customize them some more. Looking at the faction section, we can see that similar to the Corellian Corvette, the elite droid NPCs patrolling Theed and Nashville are KX series droids and are associated with their faction now. So hopefully this means that players on leave will no longer get jumped by those NPCs while doing their legacy quests. Also, again, nice touch of detail there. Looking at the quest sections now. E. Luthic Ur's quest line should now function properly. For those who don't know, Luthic is the dark force user in the Jedi Temple Ruins point of interest on Dantooine. He's the guy who you, where you can get a Padawan braid and like a Sith holocron from his quest line. So go ahead and do that if you haven't already, because it should work now. The Witches of Dathomir theme park quest recon cannot be performed again if already completed with the opposite faction. For those who don't remember, this is referring to the quest line about the Sisters of the Void section of the theme park, where you go down to the Force Ghost mother and then go hunt her daughters who have been corrupted. To my knowledge, there wasn't any reason to redo these parts, so this being fixed is a good thing, I think. If it's not, let me know. And finally, other players can no longer take out your monkey lizard. 
Thanks for watching, everybody. I really like this update. There's a lot of great small details in here, as well as some big ones like space bounding hunting. If you appreciate this video, let me know by liking, commenting, subscribing, doing all that good stuff. If you want to talk to me live, check out Twitch. I stream there regularly still, SWG Legends. We have a good time over there. Otherwise, stay hungry, everybody.